Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ODI um, and the latest of our the latest in the series of our ODI Fridays lectures. Um, I'm very happy to be introducing Lucy Knight today from ODI Devon um, and Devon County Council, who's going to explain to us um, how to get open data done in local government. Um, a couple of bits of housekeeping um, from me. Um, so for, for your questions, please hold on to them until the end, and we'll make sure that we pass around the microphone um, so for those online can, can hear you ask them. Um, and we will be live streaming the, the, the lecture. So for those watching um, online, please do use the hashtag ODI Fridays on Twitter um, to get your questions in, and we'll make sure to get those asked as well. And without further ado, I'll hand over. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm all mic'd up. Can everybody hear me? Very happy with levels and so on. Excellent. Um, so welcome, and thank you very much for coming to hear about making open data happen in local government, which on the face of it is possibly the most boring thing ever. But you're all here, so I guess you want to hear about it. Uh, shout out to any of my fellow nodes who are watching, if they're watching on a live stream, they were gutted they couldn't come heck on me in person. But there's a hashtag, so they can use that apparently. Um, so... As Jack has said, I'm Lucy Knight. I, my day job is I work for Devon County Council. I'm a data lead, I broadly describe myself as, because I just do all the data stuff and support my colleagues. Um, I'm also part of ODI Devon, which is the Devon node of the Open Data Institute. So we do some community work and some training down there. I'm going to move around a bit, and I'm going to hope that this works for moving the slides along. There we go. So why do we care about open data? Why does anybody care about open data? There's been so much hype around this. So any um, technical IT people recognize the Gartner hype cycle and seen this one? So for those that haven't seen it, basically um, Gartner bring out this, this cycle that shows how new technologies follow this hype curve. And it starts and there's some sort of a trigger and there's this massive buildup of expectations. It's amazing. It's going to fix all the world's problems and there's going to be billions of pounds in, in economic investment or in savings, as a story we were told in local government, and everything's going to be awesome, the trees are going to bloom again, it's going to fix everything. And eventually, you begin to realise that actually that's not happening. It's not in the way that we hoped it would, and you start to slide down, get very disillusioned. At the point at which I drew this particular slide, I thought we were about there. I'm going to redraw this, because I think we're beginning to come out the other side now. We're beginning to find some, some good uses and some good reasons to care about open data. But it's been a slog. It's definitely been a slog. And I think one of the reasons is, is that within local government, we need a reason to care. It's not enough. The hype is not enough. The, the tech is not enough. It would be nice if we could all get excited about new things, but we're busy enough. We've got our jobs to do. We have fewer people than we had three, four years ago. We have a lot less money than we had. So anything we put time and money into has got to be worthwhile. There's got to be a, a pragmatic a business need for it and a, and a customer or a user focus. Um, and... It's been a while since we've had to think that way, so it's been a bit of a, a learning curve for us. And of course, the transparency code helped. And this was the user case that came out of that. Do it or get into trouble. You don't have to care. You don't have to be good at it. You just have to do the absolute bare minimum. You turned it into a compliance thing. And there's one thing local government knows about, it's compliance. We can do compliance. We've been doing that for decades. We're really, really good at reporting up just what's needed and then saying, well, that's it's no use to us. The other guys wanted that. We've got our own thing that we need. So the thing about compliance and the thing about transparency especially is it's a terrible motivator. I mean, no one wants to say outright that they hate transparency or that they don't care about transparency. Because it's a bit like saying you hate puppies and sunshine. Yeah, you're not going to say that out loud. People will think you're an awful person. Some people do hate puppies and sunshine. Fair enough. Some people do hate transparency. <coughs> But the real thing is, is that it's a terribly abstract thing. It's not a good motivator. It's not a good reason to get something done. So we need to do better. We need personal reasons or organizational reasons to love open data. So on a personal level, why do I love open data? Is it because I'm a massive nerd? Well, yes, a bit. But also, because what I used to be was a data analyst, a performance analyst. My job used to be taking upwards of 10 spreadsheets, manually scraping data out of them, knitting it together and turning it into a performance report for somebody else. Nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, that person will come back and say, could you just redo that? We need that, um, but the chief officer wants it in purple and we need this graph and, oh, and by the way, Ofsted now have different requirements and they want you to report termly instead of quarterly and, and uh, the numbers and targets change and, and you would have to redo all of this manually, and it was such a nuisance. And the data that I would be scraping in, I'd have to go and physically find it every single time. I'd be like, 
somebody's got to have a definitive list of all the schools that we look after in Devon. It turns out somebody had. I could just go get it from them. Somebody's got to have the full postcode list that ties to learning communities. Yeah, somebody had. Go find that. They can maintain it and I can just have it when I need it. So I love data and I love open data. The data I like the best is the data I can find when I need it in the form I can use it. So that's why I care about open data because it made my life so much easier. I didn't have to keep going through these ad hoc, oh, but there's a special case, oh, the lead officer needs this, oh, the head of education needs this. Here it is. I would press a different button and my report would come out and I cut so much time out of my work day by doing it that way and by helping my colleagues do it that way. So when I talk about open data, what I'm really talking about is data that is accessible and usable to the people who need it. If that means it's published and shared publicly, that's great, but it's part of the wider picture of making our data useful. And this is the illustration, basically. I'm trying to... My mission within the council is to help people get all their data in some format. It doesn't have to be a big, posh database. Some format where it's usable and it can be consumed and you can have it back out any way you like. But you have to do that work first. And that's a struggle. And that's what we're learning to do. So that's me, personally, trying to save myself some time and all those repetitive tasks. Why does the council care? Well, it's because we like being champions. It's a little while ago now, but we were one of Francis Maud's exemplar councils, open data exemplars. And we love that, and we love having that badge. The interesting thing about having that badge is that the other councils that have it all have really um, big projects, technical projects, data portals and alliances and oh, massive things going on. And we were a little bit uh, stunned when our name went on that list. And we're like, we're not doing the same stuff everyone else is doing. We're not doing anything like the same scale. Have you made a terrible mistake by adding us to the bottom of the list? Or is there some special reason that we're on there? So it turns out the special reason is they just liked our attitude, which is a really good thing to hear. Our attitude is, try it, small scale, fail fast, fail cheap, and see if it, it works, see what sticks. If it didn't work, well, we haven't wasted much time or money, and actually we're learning about all the time what does work, what is effective at helping people get to grips with their data. So we don't have all the answers. We may have the you know, example of the champion badge. We don't have all the answers. We have a really extensive collection of how not to do stuff, which I think is more useful. Now, I may have done too good a job at convincing people that we can get our data in good order, because now what people are beginning to think is, well, Lucy says it's all, all we done. All we do is we feed all our spreadsheets in, and maybe, I don't know, rainbow, rainbows and pixie dust and, and unicorns and so on and so forth. And out the other side comes all the answers, and everything will be fixed. So I'm still working at that end, trying to convince people to get their data in good order so that we can then use it in different ways. And then, when we're ready to have nice things, we can start to take advantage of all the really exciting developments there. And it's not helped by, and we've got a lot of, uh, of vendors and suppliers who are trying to sell into local government who are telling us that we can have this and that we can plug everything we have into that. And my biggest fear is that somebody with more um, clout and more budget than me is going to sign up to something that we really aren't mature enough to use. So I'm, I'm putting the brakes on a bit. I want people to learn to handle their spreadsheets properly first before we go on to the data science. Right. I love this slide because people are always like, is it time to leave? No, stay where you are. The thing about making open data work in local government is that we have to learn to get out more. That's what this slide is about. Start by getting out from behind your desk. And you go and you talk to your colleagues about their pain points. You talk to people who are closer to the front line than you are and find out what's going on with them and their data collation. You talk to people who are closer to the data than you are the people who are up to their ears in different spreadsheets coming from different places and what problems that causes them. You talk to people who are closer to the elected members than you are. You talk to the members themselves and you find out what problems they have with the data they get given. And you work your way around your own organisation first and you find out what you could be doing differently or what you could be helping people do differently with their data. And then you get further out and you get out of the building and you talk to other people outside the council and you find out what their pain points are what data they might need. Excuse me, I'm going to have to rehydrate. I warned Freya that I talk too much and I dry out. There we go. So yeah, right out of the building, you talk to your critics. Those are my favourite people. Those are the people who really don't like the council because they think we're hiding stuff. Um, because they have the most to say about what we're doing wrong. 
and that's incredibly valuable. You talk to your local digital and tech clusters, you talk to developers, you talk to your activists, you talk to your um, really small organisations, SMEs, charities, and you say, what job are you trying to get done? It's never what data do you want. It's what job do you want to get done? And do we have information or data that can help? So get out of the building. If you remember nothing else about me babbling on in front of you for 20 minutes, remember that one. Get out of the building. Okay. And the second thing is try stuff. Fail fast, fail cheap, prototype. When I talk about prototyping, I'm not talking about going straight to code. This is the thing that I do the most, is I draw on the back of envelopes and on post-it notes, and corners of my notebook, and corners of other people's notebooks. What if we built something that did this? What if we built something that looked like this? Take it to the chief exec. What if I gave you something that did this? Would that be useful? I've done similar work with the, the elected members. Just a quick, scrappy drawing that says, I think we can do a thing with data that looks like this. Do you want one? And that's incredibly helpful. It starts a conversation about, well, what is it meant to do? How do I access it? Can I print it? Can I share it? What tools do we need to actually build one of those? Moving on from there, really, really basic stuff like using Google Charts to show them what an online um, dashboard would look like, playing with WordPress plugins, really, really simple, free, open source stuff that you can just mess around with and show people, show the thing, don't tell, has been incredibly valuable. It helps that I'm a very visual person, but it helps everybody else as well, I find. So a couple of examples of where this approach has really worked. And the two I'm about to show you are my absolute favourites because in both cases, these are led by the business coming to me, people within the council coming to me and saying, I have a problem. Can you help me? Um, so in this case, my colleague Jo Fellows, whose name is there as a contact, she's a senior manager within HR. And she came to me and she said, you, you're always banging on about open data and how we should share more. I have an issue where I'm sharing information, HR data about numbers of people and head count turnover and sickness and so on and the managers are still asking me to reproduce ad hoc reports because they don't get what they're being given and we've also got FOIs coming in we've also got unions on our case asking us about um, redundancies how do we get information out to them in a different way so whatever we do I want that to be open public facing because I just want people to see that the data is out there and so this is what we did and we started with scribbles on paper and we went on to um, I think Google Charts, really, really quick representation. And we ended up using, we've now got the corporate tool, which is Power BI, which is a Microsoft add-on, which is you know, really rather good. And you can embed into a web page. So this is a public-facing web page that says, I think we've got about five or six pages to this report. So it's got headcount, it's got people, this one is people who've been cheapied out. We've got, um, let me see, a sickness absence, there's, there's turnover, there's all the things that people usually ask about, all public facing. I think we went through about 12 iterations before we reached something that looked a bit like this. And at that point, my absolute favorite thing happened, which was I gave it away and it became not my problem anymore. It's owned by HR. HR management information team now maintain this. They do all the work. All I've done is prototype and say this is how it's done. It's a sustainable thing because HR want that data to go out in that way because it's saved them so much manual processing and, and repeated sort of just tinkering with the report to change it for such and such a manager. So they own it. And that's been a real success story for me because from start to finish, that's exactly how I want it to go. I'll show you how and then you do it. Second example is not quite so far along, but it's following the same path. <coughs> now within councils that have social care um, services, we're we duty to produce a market position statement. So this is the thing that says, um, this is the need as we see it. We've got population figures, we've got health data. This is the provision as we see it, the numbers of providers of nursing, residential places, and so on. And here's what we intend to commission for the coming year or two years or three years. Now, traditionally, this has been a, oh goodness, I don't know, 80-page PDF, which nobody reads and everybody hates, especially the people who have to produce it. But it is a useful document because that work has been done to get all that data together. Now, my absolute favourite thing about this one is that the team responsible for that said, we want to do this differently. We hear you know a thing or two about dashboards, and we'd like to do the market position statement as a public-facing sort of online guide with a dashboard. And I said, well, that's fine. You know, look at your uh, PDF. You basically want me to reproduce the structure of this document? They went, oh, God, no. 
burn it down and start again. Change everything. We do not want you to just reproduce that document online. What we want is for you to turn into something a lot more appealing. So I had to call in some help from people who are better at design than I am. I've plugged the data in. This is iteration six or seven, I think, and it started off very scrappy and it's beginning to come together. We've got filters for town area, and it's beginning to look really useful. Another, I don't know, two to three weeks, it'll be live. At the moment, it's just up on our beta site so people can look at it and give us feedback, which is another thing that we do. We open it up early, say it's not done, it's not perfect, but do tell us if there's anything you like, you hate, or you'd like to see, because it's still early enough to feed that in. So that's really coming together, and I'm very, very pleased with that. And I say my favourite thing about that is the fact that they just said, no, scrap everything, start again, tell us what you think it should look like. has been incredibly useful. Oh, the other favourite thing, this will be used internally as well. No more producing special reports internally for the commissioners. The commissioners of adult social care will also use this to work out what's going on, where they think the gaps are, as well as it being facing outwards to the providers who can take a look and make decisions about investing in their business and growing their business locally. So that makes it, for me, a really big win because it means that everyone is using the same data. They're all looking at the same thing. So how do we make stuff like this happen? I already talked about getting out of the building. I already talked about prototyping. The important thing, the thing that makes the getting out happen, the prototyping happen, is to give people space. So physical space, and this is why we've got the jam room. We have this space that uh, used to be a meeting room and is now a sort of a co-working drop-in um, room. It sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. It's not a Google campus. It's more like my colleague described it as a sixth form common room. It's <laughs> second-hand sofas and some Ikea, you know, those cabinets with the drawers. It's basic, but it is a friendly space. And I have a lot of my meetings in there. I encourage people to come in there to, if they're talking to me, meeting me because you can't be pompous when you're sat around a coffee table on an antique armchair. You just can't. You can't do that thing where you've got the, uh, your agenda in front of you and there's always someone who takes off their watch and stands up on the table so they can keep track and make sure you stay on time. Can't do that. Can't do that in the jam room. We have Code Club in there. People use it for the yoga class. It's a really friendly space. The physical space is only one thing. Um, more important is emotional space. And what I have found is that People need to feel safe to play and to fail if necessary and to pick themselves up and to play again. And they need to see people doing that and not get into trouble for it. So people like me are a bit of a, um, a lightning rod for that. If they see that I'm so far getting away with it, then hopefully they'll feel emboldened to do that themselves. There's something about letting people know it is okay. With everything that's going on in local government, it's a really bad time to look like you're not busy enough it's a really bad time to look like you are just messing about and playing. It really doesn't feel safe or healthy to not be at your desk head down 24-7. So the emotional space to say, no, it is okay, we would like you to try stuff, we would like you to bring us ideas, that is okay, is very important, and Devon is doing that really, really well. Third type of space is technical. Now, I mentioned I got to play with Google Charts and, and WordPress and plugins and so on. They gave me a sandbox basically, on the website, on the beta site, and said, you literally can do anything you want there. You break it, your problem. You can't affect anything that is um, corporate content. You can't change anything or break anything that belongs to anybody else. You can literally download and install anything you like. If it all goes pear-shaped, well, too bad. You have to fix it or build it, rebuild it, whatever. And that was wonderful, because I got to do a lot of learning, got to do a lot of technical learning, but I also had to think really, really hard about what the tools that I chose, if they were free and open source, how they would affect my colleagues in ICT, who would have to maintain stuff, who would have to deal with security. I had to build those relationships within ICT as well. So that was really good for me in all sorts of ways. The other thing is people always talk about challenges. What were the challenges? I don't think the things I'm about to talk about are challenges. Because to me, a challenge is a sentence that begins with, I bet you can't, usually followed by some really stupid thing you probably didn't want to do anyway. Maybe I've been on too many rugby tours, but challenges is not the word. The word is hurdles. They're things you have to get past. You have to get over, under, round, through, whatever it takes. But you have to deal with those things because they're in your way 
and they're not going away unless you find a solution for dealing with them. If you'll forgive me, because there are six of them, and I may forget, I'll go off at a tangent, I'm going to check my list. Here we go. So in order, fear of change is a huge hurdle. People are afraid of change. And we sometimes talk about people who are afraid of change as if that's somehow a problem with them. They're not brave enough. They're not technical enough. They're not modern enough. Um, and that won't do, because people who are worried about change have good reasons, especially if they've worked in the public sector. If you've worked in, in local government for more than about five years, you will have had a change initiative dropped on your head. And it probably will have hurt. And not much will have changed. And so when shiny people like me show up going, we're going to change everything, we're going to disrupt you, just you know, brace yourself, because this is happening. And we don't get the overjoyed reaction that we are expecting. We say, oh, they're just frightened of change. That's not fair, and that's not OK. So if people are afraid of change, find out why. What went wrong last time, and probably the time before, and the time before, and the time before. Find out how you can get past those problems. Involve those people in the discussions about why you want to make this change and why this one is going to be different. If it's going to be different, you may learn something. Second hurdle, fear of failure. Again, if you've worked in local government at all, you've seen what happens when you fail. You've seen what happens if things go wrong, if a project doesn't happen or comes in massively over budget over time. People's careers suffer. So people are not comfortable with failing or with it being well documented that they failed. And there needs to be, as I said, that safe environment where a little bit of failure is a good thing if it saves you grief down the line. So that is another thing that we need to be not just tolerant of, but understanding of. Why is it a problem if you fail? What's going to happen? And work out what we can do to get through that with the people who are experiencing that fear. Number three, systems, obstructive systems. This is my pet peeve, is that we have so many technical systems, they store data, and we've been sold this thing, and it's going to solve all our problems, it's going to be amazing. And you say, that's great, and it's got all the data. I would like to get my data out, please, in a different way. I want to extract um, a full set of some attribute, and I'd like a CSV, and I'd like these columns in it. And the supplier will come, and they will talk to you, and they'll do that thing, and I'll go, ooh, yeah that's going to cost you. <coughs> it's like, I paid for the system. It's my data. I have paid for my people to put that data in, and now it's going to cost me to get it back out. Why can't I just write myself a report? Oh, the report manager won't do that. Whatever the reason is. So we had one supplier who actually did quotas. I think it was £11,000 to write one report to get a full data dump out of the back end of a system we had already paid for. We don't work with them anymore. They lost that contract because that simply wasn't good enough. Because we had the skills to do it ourselves, but we weren't allowed to. So we now have a different system. My colleague built himself in WordPress because it was a simple database of risks, risks and impacts. So yeah, we don't do that anymore. And we need to learn not to procure systems that don't give us that control over our own data. That data is our asset. We've added value to it, we've added rich, richness to it, we've taken other people's data, stitched it in, we've turned it into something really valuable, really useful. We have to be able to get it back out the way that people need it so they can use it. So systems is a big hurdle. We need to get better at that. Oh, we've gone dead. Hang on. It's only a picture of a brick wall. It's probably not that big a deal. But hang on. I'll just carry on talking while the computer catches up with me. So skills gaps, seen as a big hurdle, but actually it's not the hurdle that you think. Yes, there are skills gaps, but the gaps actually in our knowledge of where the skills are. There are people working in local government who are brilliant. They are smart, they are switched on, they experiment, they play, they code, they sketch, they design. They do amazing things, but those things are not what they were hired for you'll have expert coders who are basically moving bits of paper from one tray to another, or working on reception, or um, working in social care. And those jobs are important, and those jobs are great, but, but those people have those skills. So if you walk around your organization saying, oh, but mm, we just don't have the technical skills, those people feel bad, because they do, but you don't know. You're not asking who within this organization can help us do this. You're saying, oh, you know, we can't afford to hire people who can do that. You already have them, I guarantee it. 
And this is all part and parcel of get out from behind your desk, go talk to people, find out what people know and what they can do. There will be people who can give an hour or two to brainstorm, to come up with something, to say, I know where someone who does that, I know where there's a template for that. But there definitely, definitely are the skills. Number five on the list, poor relationships. And this comes back to the, the fear of change, fear of failure people. They've been burned before, they don't want to talk to you now. And you have to go rebuild those relationships. You have to go and find out what it is they need from you before they will go with you on a journey of shiny new technology and releasing open data and getting that out there. So that is a big deal. You have to reforge relationships with people who are in control of some data asset or some system before you're going to make it happen. So it boils down to making friends, basically. You've got to make friends. And finally, lack of networks. So a bit like poor relationships, but on the outside. You can't do all this from within the council. You've got skilled people. Yes, you've got data. Yes, you've got systems. Yes, but you still need to find out who outside the organisation knows stuff that you don't. And there are lots of those. There are lots of things we don't know as councils. We like to think we know everything. We do not. We need to be talking to the charities. What are the problems they're trying to solve? Who are the vulnerable people they're trying to reach that we maybe aren't at the moment? Um, we need to be talking to developers and the small organisations and the slightly larger organisations and the big organisations who are trying to do technical things. What do they know that we don't? What do they need that we have? You've got to form those networks. And again, it's not a good time to be, for instance, running up to London to give talks, um, networking, conferencing, but we must. We need those links into other organisations so that we can make connections. We really, really need to do these things. So those are the hurdles. It's gone dead again, isn't it? Press the button. There we go. Very cool. Fascinating. Right, so this slide, I left this one in because the last time I gave this talk it was entitled Data-Driven Innovation in Local Government. And so I put this one in because data doesn't innovate, people do. Everything that I've said about you know, the tools and the prototyping and the networking and giving talks and conferencing and everything else, it boils down to make friends, get out, talk to people. Find the people who know what you don't know. Find the people who need what you have. Find the people who have what you need. Make friends and turn yourself into a connector and you will soon find the reasons why people want open data, the people who can help you do it. But it's, it's all about people, absolutely. Always, always about people. And I think that's the end, thank you. And are there any questions? And don't forget to hold the mic if you ask a question. Okay. Yeah, so did anyone have any questions from the, in the room? Sorry, carry on. Oh, thanks for the. Oh, this isn't, is it? Hello, hello. There's no sound coming here. Oh, sorry. Hello, hello, YouTube. Um, t uh, two questions. Well, one observation and one question. Um, the question is, um, you put up a slide at one point with unicorns written on it. Yes. What has that got to do? Not necessarily by your opinion, but why, why was that on there in a local government slide, which is an unusual thing to see. I know it's one of these sort of buzzwords. Yes. Um, and the second thing to say is um, for people who like horse racing or from the countryside, that brick wall isn't a hurdle. A hurdle is, is a made of birch. Should I put a water jump in instead? Um, depends. Col Col Colin Jackson would say they're about three foot six. But women have smaller hurdles in their okay. races, unfortunately. <laughs> I'll take that on board. OK, so um, the, hurdle, the hurdles are harder to draw than brick walls. So uh, all the slides, I've drawn those myself, and it was just whatever I could draw really quickly. But yeah, point taken. Um, so why unicorns? Well, because <sighs> it is a buzzword. And it's been thrown about so much. You know, the unicorn, the mythical data scientist who's going to, who can do everything. That one individual who has all the skills. Um, and I mean, yes, they exist. But they're all working for Google and you know, huge organizations that can pay them ridiculous amounts of money. But what we do have is people who have some subset of those skills who can also communicate and who can also work as part of a team. And those people are incredibly valuable. Techie people who can communicate, design people who can talk tech, and people who can be in a room without starting a fight. You want those. 
So your unicorn is actually more like a pantomime horse, about three or four people, maybe a Chinese dragon, sort of 15 people. But that, that's what's needed, is that collation of skills. And this slide was, was just about how people think they want this. They think they want this to sort out their data. They have no idea what's in it, but they know that it's possible because they're seeing sort of tech articles and news. And they don't understand that our input is not in a fit state to go into a process or a system like that, and that we have so much work to do at that front end. But they, they believe, they are told that the unicorns will fix it. So that's, you know, we've got to work on the data maturity of organizations to help people understand what it is we need to do. There is work involved, and there's no magic bullet. Okay. There was... Yeah, I have a weird meeting from the front, but... Um, some of the local authorities are looking at their policy people, which are in mm -hmm. all their different directorates, and, and seeing how they can be, how their skills can be, I guess, moulded into more data scientist type skills. Is, yeah. that, is that something you're seeing within Devon County Council? Um, a little bit. Technically, yes. Technically, I'm a policy person, um, but I'm a very nerdy one. So, I guess, special case. But yeah, um, because policy people also tend to be very well networked. And they understand where information is, and they've got that experience of bringing information together from lots of different teams and turning it into a coherent strategy for getting something done. Um, but I, like I said, the people are in unexpected places all over the organization. If your policy people can, can do this and can connect up to people and can pull in the skills, they should do it, absolutely. One, I would say it is not a job for ICT. It's not a job for your information technology team, because although they would have the technical skills, they don't get out as much as they ought to. They aren't allowed to get out as much as they should. I know they'd like to, in my experience of my colleagues, is they would like to get out more, but that they have quite strict bounds around what their job is perceived to be, and they have projects that must be done on time, and so on and so forth. So it should not sit with an ICT. It should be, I think, a policy or an organizational development thing just to upskill and to get more data out. So the chief executive should have a view on it not the head of IT. Head of IT should be involved, but it should be a whole organisation thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you. Any other questions, yeah, observations? Sorry, yeah, in the room. Um, otherwise, I'd ask Anna for some questions from Twitter. <coughs> so, so luckily, I have one in my back pocket. OK. Um, uh, so the question I was going to ask is, so you showed us the example of the care, so the care data that was exposed. And yes, was in market position statement. Yeah. That one, yeah. Um, are there any other examples not from Devon that you're sort of jealous of or would like to, to copy? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, well, probably too many to mention. Um, <coughs> Leeds have done some really good things, obviously. Um, ODI Leeds, which is the Leeds node, are very active and have worked a lot with the council and with um, private sector. Uh, with other public sector bodies to get lots of different data together from different organisations. So, I mean, they've got um, the, the utilities data in there and all sorts of things. So that's really good work. Um, but also the things I really admire are people like uh, Democracy Club, so not a council, where they're trying to bring national data together. Because we can release as many data sets as we like about Devon or Leeds or Manchester. But until you start to stitch those together, you can't meaningfully make a service that is, is nationally relevant and useful because there will there'll be these gaps. So we all have to start putting our data out in the same way and get as many councils as possible doing that so that we can um, bring some pressure to bear on all the places where there are gaps and say, let's, let's all have that so we have proper coverage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could go on for hours about the people I wish I was. Uh, yeah, there's some fantastic work going on, definitely. I come from Barnet. Mm -hmm. Barnet has outsourced everything to Capita. Yes. Capita, local councils tell me that Capita IT system is not of the best I couldn't possibly best possible quality. I'm, I'm aware Private Eye has a rather rude version of Capita. Perhaps we all know about that. Um, do you have any comments about their performance and would they understand exactly what you're talking about? With Capita here? Or, or Barnet? Either. Both. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, so I think organizations that outsource their IT are in a good position to have just what they need when they need it for their money, if they have spec'd it correctly, if they have procured it correctly. And this is something that uh, we're not good at in the public sector. We've not had to be good at this. We provide services. The government gives us money. Money goes in, services come out. And there's never been any question but that that was what we were there for. 
our purpose has been to provide those services. I mean, we're having to question those things now. And I think there was an example about, about five or six years ago, and we were looking at outsourcing something specific. I think it might have been um, children's social care, something like that. And an organisation got in touch and offered to actually teach us to negotiate. And it turned out it was one of the organisations that was um, hoping to bid for the work because they said it was just embarrassing how bad we were at negotiating terms and conditions within the contract. And they, they did actually run some sort of procurement <coughs> negotiation um, away days. Because that's how bad we were. So we need to be better at that. We need to be better at understanding actually what it is. We're not procuring a system or a product. We are procuring an outcome. And if your product will do that, that is great. But you have to show me how it will do that. And these are the things I need to see. So I mean, I've got no specific comment about Barnet or about Capita, because that would just be rude. Um, but as councils, we need to be better at telling people what it is we need. And we need to be more open to being vulnerable and saying we don't know what we're doing. We do know that this is what needs to happen. So it should be, in an ideal world, it should be a good solution. Can I ride it to that? Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've got a follow-up. Ask my local councillor, how, how well is Capita protected against ransomware? Mm -hmm. And it's gone to, to Capita about th three or four weeks ago. No reply has come back yet. Yeah. They wanted to know if they have had paid out. I'm not talking about that. Another interesting case was Barnet Library System had all their data on one hard disk, which went to Capita and disappeared. And they've had to re-enter every single book Goodness. in the Barnet Library system by hand uh -huh. back into a database. Yes. That's, that's Capita is less than impressive. Sorry. Sorry if anybody from Capita is <laughs> Any of my friends who work at Capita are listening. I love you guys. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a failure in all sorts of places. One hard disk is never going to be a good idea. These things happen, and that's why we then have emergency plans and disaster recovery plans, because you can't really plan for a disaster without actually having a disaster, because you just don't know what's going to happen. Do they have such a plan? That's the question. Yes, indeed. Well, hopefully they've got one now. So, yeah, I know, fingers crossed. But yeah, these things do happen. Any, Any other questions? Thing? Are you aware, or can you tell us in any way you're aware of engagement from the outside? You talked about what's gone in on inside Devon County Council, but have you had engagement from the public or from the media in Devon making use of your stuff? Yes, yes. One, one favourite example where we had a, um, a developer who moved into Devon uh, and was looking to um, kind of publicise the fact that he was available for contracts and was also looking to develop a particular skill. I think he wanted to learn Ruby. Um, which he hadn't really played with very much and he wanted a project. Um, so he sat down and he did a quick Google search and found that obviously we were releasing our transparency code data. Um, so he took the spend over £500 pounds, um, files and he um, downloaded them all and he cleaned them up and he turned it into, so a little bit like the work that the Spend Network has done, a nice visualisation of what's being spent on what, by whom, where, when. Um, and then he very quickly, I, I can't remember how he got in touch with us, I think he might have tweeted or he might have sent a comment at the, um, using the form at the bottom of the web page. Either way, it came to me, because people know that's my thing. Um, and he just said, I built this. I wondered if you guys had any comment. And it was just like, this is fantastic. This is completely unsolicited. He's just decided to use our data to build a thing. So um, I emailed him back and said, well, this is amazing. I really love what you've done. Would you mind if we did a quick uh, like email interview? And then we ran a blog post where we just you know, asked him, why did, you, why did you pick this? What do you think you, of, of what you've done? Are you happy with it? Do you plan to do any more? Just a general conversation about why he decided to do this. And it was really, really good. So that's, that's a favorite example. Another one which demonstrates the power of the network is we had some data that went out and is around community assets, so buildings and patches of land and old depots and things that the council owns. And we've got lots, because Devon is a big place, so we've got lots of bits and pieces. We were looking to divest some of those because we don't need them. We're spending money maintaining them or guarding them. And actually, there are community groups who could make more use. So we had this web page where we had like, a map. And if you said, right, I live in Ashburton, it would zoom in and say, right, well, these are the properties, you know, the old firehouse and the former school and this, that, and the other. And um, I asked, as I always do on Twitter, everyone who knows me, guys, this data's out there. Go for it. Tear it apart. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me what mistakes we've made. And they did. God bless them. And one of the things was that things were showing up in the wrong place on the map. 
Um, and so between them, two friends, Owen Boswava, who's an activist, Mark Braggins, who uh, at the time worked for Hampshire County Council, is now independent, between them worked out that we basically got the wrong map projection. When we'd done the coordinates and we'd done a conversion, we'd got the wrong map projection. This is where the magic happened, is that a developer that I know, who's also on Twitter, saw that the original data was in GitHub. So he wrote a code that would do the right conversion, sent me a pull request. And it was fixed by the end of the day. Just like that. Just because I know really smart people who are inclined to step up and help when we've got a problem. So we made a huge boo-boo, and people helped us fix it. And that was just wonderful. So those, those are two of my favorites. I'm hoping for some new ones, because people probably get tired about hearing about those. Keep trotting them out. But that's the sort of relationship I want to have with people outside the council. And that is the sort of facility I want to have for fixing data inside the council. People can tell us about a problem, and it's that simple to sort it out. Thanks, Lucy. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, if you don't have any other questions, I think all that's left is to thank you for, okay. for coming and giving us the talk. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.